everybody. Welcome to another wonderful, marvellous, exciting episode uh, from Tales from the Doghouse, Separation Anxiety Explained. Here we are again. I am Sarah McLaren. I am with, who am I with? Separation Anxiety Solutions in the UK. And with me is the wonderful... Ness Jones. I am in Australia from Separation Anxiety in Dogs Decoders. And also we have... I am... Stacey Bell in the U.S. with Focus Fun. Um, today we are tackling another misconception. Um, we're going to talk about food in training. Um, I think the misconception that we're tackling is that you should use food in home alone training with your separation anxiety dog. Mm. Um, so Ness and Sarah... What have you guys seen with your clients um, with food? Have, have most of them tried that before they've gotten to you? Yeah, because um, most people get onto Dr. Google and Dr. Google doesn't always have very good <laughs> advice. Um, that is Dr. true. Dr. Google got his um, credentials out of a um, cornflakes packet. Mm. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, the, um, yes, definitely. Uh, um, have tried food and it's the whole um, I gave him a Kong and walked out the door and he didn't touch it till I got home generally or they'll gobble it up and then they'll still freak out yeah yeah, what yeah. About you, Sarah? So, either that or that's the other one is where they they were doing trying incremental steps by using a Kong uh, and they were fine up until they got to 20 minutes uh, and then the dog fell apart. But that's because it took the dog 20 minutes to eat the Kong uh, and yeah. then suddenly realised there was nobody there and went, oh, my God, I'm all alone. Uh, so <laughs> the incremental steps did absolutely nothing, God bless them, despite all the time that they'd taken because the dog was so distracted by the Kong that it didn't notice that they'd gone. And I think the <laughs> thing with the, the distraction concept is... Yeah. Okay, you might get your a 20-minute window, but your goal might be to go out for four hours. So what on earth are you going to get your dog that's going to last four hours to distract them? Right, right. So I um, have had the same experience with my clients. I think the number one response is that the dog doesn't eat it. Um, mm -hmm. And then the second one is that the dog will eat it finish it and then start the freaking out process. So <clears throat> traditionally we don't, none of us would use food in training. Um, the other kind of part that we've um, addressed a little bit on the show, but is worth revisiting since this is what this specific episode is about is just, um, I think a lot of times when we're trying to change our dog's emotional response to a trigger. And that could be seeing another dog while they're on the leash, or it could be leaving them being alone as the trigger. But a lot of times when we're using, um, when we're trying to change our dog's emotional response from a negative one to a positive one, we use food. So even a lot of um, trainers who maybe don't specialize in separation anxiety or vets or even vet behaviorists will recommend food. Um, and it creates, I think, a lot of conflict for people because they're hearing maybe from somebody they trust like their vet or vet behaviorist that they should be using food. And then we're saying, no, 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 food is not really um, real valuable in the process. Um, it can kind of, it, it can be difficult to know which way to go. So that's why I think we should dig a little bit into um, learning theory and how we change a dog's emotional response to something. So do you mm -hmm. guys want me to give a little overview or do yeah. one of you want to do it? Before you do that, I would just like to add into what you're saying or reinforce what you're saying is that um, I think that's really a big challenge for doggy guardians to um, overcome is when their vet or exactly a vet behaviorist who is they've paid a heck of a lot of money to see is saying no 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 no, no. you need to use food yeah mm -hmm. and then I mean if I paid this person who's a professional you know and has you know you paid a 
heck of a lot of sorry there's noise going on in the background it's really distracting um yeah who's paid a lot of money for um and maybe waited weeks to go and see mm-hmm. yeah. Say, no, yeah yeah and you just yeah you're gonna think well they must be right so yeah right right yeah in the in the vet behavior i just talked to one of my clients today who's having oh they have kind of a they're a trickier case because they they're dealing with um some um frustrated greeting behavior on leash when when the dog sees other dogs or people um but also some health concerns and pain related things Mm -hmm. and also separation anxiety so there's a lot going on and um we're working together with the vet and the vet is is thinking about referring to a vet behaviorist and she was telling me that the vet behaviorist that they referred to was 743 American dollars for that initial consultation. And oh I was gosh. just like, wow, <laughs> wow. Um, so, I mean, that's a lot of money. And you that's, know, honestly, that's irrespective of the medication that they're probably going to tell you to pay right. for as well, which isn't cheap either. Right, right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of money and it's gone up. And, you know, honestly, if the vet behaviorist um, can help your dog be home alone by supporting them with medication, getting to the bottom of, um, some of the pain related things in this case specifically, Mm -hmm. um, or can help with the other behavioral issues, then, then it could very well be worth it, but it's just a lot, a big chunk of money up front, um, to pay for that kind of thing. So, um, it is what it is. Um, so um, because it was just 4th of July here, I'm going to use um, sound phobia as our, so we're, we're in this example, um, the dog who is named Roscoe is going to be afraid of um, fireworks. And so um, it is many months, many months before 4th of July, and you know that your dog is um, afraid of fireworks. So um, what you would do to help your dog be not afraid of fireworks is to do counter conditioning um, and desensitization. So what we wanna do is make the fireworks no big deal. And so what we would do is we would turn down the intensity on fireworks, which, you know, if we are playing a recording of fireworks, it will be less intense um, because we can do the volume, but also you're not gonna get that, um, the shaking that might happen with fireworks. Um, So uh, we would do a lower intensity of the scary thing, in this case, fireworks, and we would turn firework sounds on at a low enough intensity where Roscoe recognizes it, but he's not going to be afraid of it, right? So we have the, the low, level fireworks on, turn that on. And then we're going to do something that Roscoe loves. Roscoe loves chicken. So we're going to give him lots of chicken. And then we are going to turn off the the music, stop the chicken. And um, we are going to continue to do that, repeat that. Um, So sound, then chicken is the most important part, sound, then chicken, uh, or scary sound or triggering thing, and then chicken. Then once we start seeing that Roscoe has a positive conditioned emotional response, that just means he has good feelings about the, it, the firework sounds at that intensity, we're going to turn it up just a little bit and we're going to repeat. And so that's how we do that kind of, we're gradually desensitizing them to the fireworks, but we're also using food. Mm-hmm. Um, so... How, how, how would we know that Roscoe's having a, a positive emotional response to the fireworks at that intensity? What, what clue would the owners have to that one? That is an excellent question, Sarah. Um, a <laughs> lot of times you'll see loose and wiggly behavior um, and also anticipation of the chicken, right? So like he might... <laughs> Roscoe might hear the sound and like, look, you know how they get that happy face where they're like, like that, (laughs) like 
their mouth is open, their tongue is out, and they like kind of like look up at you with like love and anticipation. Love is for the chicken, probably, but you know, um, that would indicate, you know, they might have like a loose body wag, um, that sort of thing. But basically, like if the sound is predicting reward, then you've um, got a positive conditioned emotional response. Do you guys mm -hmm. want to add anything to that? Uh, it's not just, I was just thinking of um, my uh, guys used to have a thing with the um, fire alarm in, in the house, smoke alarm. Um, for some reason, the smoke alarm in our house was far too close to the cooker uh, and would go off <laughs> quite regularly. Uh, and we. Maybe you're had, not, uh, not a very good cook. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. It was, it was just it was far too sensitive, way too sensitive, stupid thing. Anyway, we had, we've always have. Um, I'm going to show you one now. So if you are listening to this, you won't know what I'm going to show you. But for those who can see, um, we've got things like this all over the place. So this is a massive jar mm -hmm. full of treats of, of varying descriptions. Yeah. Yep. We, mine over. aren't as good, but I also have jars of treats stationed Yay. through my house. Oh, my God. I'm a little <laughs> bit more low budget. I've got bags of treats. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's popular. <laughs> every time because the fire alarm was slightly less predictable um and also you do get them sometimes you get smoke alarms on television programs um or on adverts and things oh, like that right. so what would happen is every time a fire alarm went off we'd all run out to the kitchen and grab hold of the nearest um jar of treats and basically <laughs> fling them around all over the place until somebody <laughs> could go and beat the smoke alarm into submission with a sweeping brush as you do and we got to uh -huh. the point with the smoke alarm where when the smoke alarm went off, both the dogs would then run into the kitchen going, where's the food, where's the food, where's the food? <laughs> which was much better than the original response that we got from Molly, which was running around me, panicking to the point where she was grabbing my arms with a gob. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. She got in such a panic, she didn't know what to do. So even though it was quite a bit like fireworks, it was slightly unpredictable uh mm -hmm. we're not taking my cooking into account at all uh we still managed to with enough repetition and remembering that every time the fire alarm went off that's the thing isn't it is that every right. time it happens you go and get the sweeties and you shower mm -hmm. them and you speak to them and you do everything you can to make it as nice as possible if you do that enough eventually their emotional response to it will change mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. what we're looking for yeah isn't it? well surely yeah. and, and you touched on something yeah. really big there just um, with that one-to-one -one correlation, right? Like every time we hear fireworks or every time the smoke alarm goes off or every time the scary thing happens, we're going to follow that up with a chicken party or throwing chicken treats party. around the kitchen <laughs> or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and some people even put um, a... Uh, a, a word to predict that the chicken party is coming uh, to mm -hmm. give them a little bit of time to get to the jar or whatever, or the baggie in Nessa's case. Um, <laughs> so um, I say yay because uh -huh. at the time it wasn't something I said a lot, but some people are like, that's amazing or, you know, whatever it is, but it just buys you that little bit of time where, because they know that yay means something fantastic is about to happen. So it kind of gives you a, a little bit of cushion, um, but that's kind of like not what we're talking about today. No, <laughs> so it, that's exactly what I was going to say. So um, that's all very well, but what if my, surely I can use food for separation anxiety training then? If right. I can use so it in this instance. <laughs> well, and I kind of oh. wish, right, because it would give us more flexibility. When we're, we're using food with separation anxiety, we're giving them the food and then we're leaving, right? So the order of operations is flipped. And um, what ends up happening for a lot of dogs is that giving of food before you leave, whether it's a Kong, let's say in this case, I give Roscoe a frozen Kong before I leave. And um, when I give him the Kong, his 
like you'll see the tail tuck and the head droop and the, you know, because what we've done is the opposite. We said, when you see this Kong, a scary thing is going to happen. So we've kind of reversed things. So for a mm -hmm. lot of dogs, they won't eat peanut butter or they won't eat Kongs at all after there's enough repetitions of that. But like we said, some dogs don't necessarily make that connection and they'll still eat it, but then feel a little worried or anxious when they finish. So mm. just on that point, Stacey, um, I think that mm -hmm. is another misconception being that the dog's not stressed because they're able to eat food. And yes. a lot of people, yes. Yes. trainers and vets running around saying that, oh, they're not stressed because they're eating the food. So they're not anxious. Mm -hmm. They don't have separation anxiety. What is that? That's a, Wait, bit, like, still. That's a bit like saying that I don't oh, eat chocolate when chocolate. I'm stressed. <laughs> I'm going to send some of this to Ness. Um, no advertising, so I'm going to hide that. Um <laughs> Yeah, uh, that is, I mean, that's, I mean, it's, it's a bit like people, there are some people who, when they're really stressed, stop eating, but there's just as many people who, when they're really stressed, eat more. Yeah, they eat um, yeah. sweets and, and, and carbs and uh, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and they or don't, they and then, it, then we turn into, you know. a, yes, that's what I was just going to say, it's kind of like, it's almost, it's manic, isn't it, in, in consumption, it's not, they're not savouring that one little piece of chocolate for three hours. You know, it's, it's like shoveling it in uh, as quick mm -hmm. as you can. So there's a, there's a very different, they will eat differently. And if you watch your dogs as well, if you're watching them on camera, which of course we always are, because that's what we keep telling you to do is to watch them on camera. Yes, if they do. are dogs that consume when you are absent, watch the way that they consume compared to normal. And we can pretty much, I will mm -hmm. put, money on it that there's a way that they consume compared to when you are there mm -hmm. yeah yeah i agree um sorry it's really it's windy like here and i keep hearing this weird thump i'm like what it's just like this banging against the house and we don't have trees and i'm like what is that what's going on it's a bit freaky sorry gone <laughs> rowan would be barking right now if he was at your house he would be saving us from the thump. Um, <laughs> he would. Um, and, and then I would be throwing stuff from the jar. That's yeah. Going, yay! <laughs> yay! It's a thump! Yay! I love thumps! Um, the other thing I was going to say is, is that you'll hear probably all of us at some given point say something to the effect of, food complicates training. And usually what I mean when I'm talking, when I'm saying something to that effect is that, um, you know, for a dog that's going to eat, um, it's really more down to the amount of time it takes for the dog to finish the Kong or the bully stick or the, you know, whatever, than them actually feeling comfortable during that time. So we heard like we were talking about the food being a distraction. So the food really is a distraction, but then um, it might take Roscoe 20 minutes, one day to finish the Kong and 30 minutes the next day to finish the Kong, just because he got distracted by some sounds or he went up to get a drink of water or, you know, whatever. And then that makes training a little bit difficult because what you're really looking at is the time from when the dog finishes the food Kong, whatever, um, until you return. Right. So it kind mm -hmm. of becomes really tricky. And, and so I really, I really wouldn't train with food for all of the reasons. That so what you're saying, about. Stacey, is that we can't mark the, the real duration of your absence because, because of that distraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's like going to vary each time because of what Roscoe might be. Mm -hmm. So it makes time. it difficult to make planning training plans um, yeah. as a result. Yeah, and you're going to get um, you're going to get false positives as well. Like you're going to get false readings where you think your dog can do thirty minutes or thirty five when actually they can only do ten or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, uh, that it will create far too many variables for you to ever get a grip on what's going on yeah 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 so yeah. 
I guess the question is then, if we're not using food, how do we build up the absences? I mean, do, do you think, I guess my question is, have, have we made a convincing argument? If you were talking to a vet, if you were a dog owner or dog pet parent, whatever you want to call them, um, and you went to your vet with a, your dog's got separation anxiety and um, said, well, my trainer who's certified in separation anxiety mm. and is in America or Australia or the UK and their name is Stacey Ness or Sarah, <laughs> Um, <laughs> said, um, told me that I'm not to use food and my vet turned around and said, no, 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 they don't know what they're talking about. How do they counter that argument? I have had um, clients who have been working with me but then gone to a vet behaviorist for um, medication help, support, and um, basically what what I mean, I am always happy to talk to a vet or a vet mm. behaviorist or whatever as part of um, supporting that client. So um, I always make that available. But a lot of times, because the client also feels conflicted, or because they feel like they paid all this money, I don't want to not do what this person says, I'll say, okay, let's try it. Let's just do it. And then their dog doesn't eat the Kong. And then mm. they're like, oh, okay. And I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't work for your dog. You know, like, so, I mean, I do all the explaining and all of the stuff that we just talked about. But then I also say, let's try it. Like if, if your vet behaviorist really wants us to try, we can try it. Um, and, mm. and, I, and I kind of feel like I've never had a dog that then excels because we introduced introduce food. So I, it, it's very quick test and it takes the angst out of it, you know? So that's mm. how I handle it. How do you guys handle it? Sort of said, well, we'll just do what your vet says, except we just won't tell them that we're not using food. <clears throat> mm. Okay. Because, because you yeah. went to them really for their expert knowledge and um, medication and you've come to me for my expert knowledge and training. So let's just mm. keep, the, let's keep the two things separate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'll say, I mean, I've been very lucky in that so far I haven't had any clients who've been to see a vet behaviourist who have told them to use food. Most of the um, ones that most of my clients, if they have seen a vet behaviourist, have, have been on the same kind of wavelength or they've only seen them for medication, not for the behaviour side. Um, but it is, I mean, I, I can imagine what, if you are paying all that money to see a vet behaviourist and they're telling you to use food, it mm -hmm. must be very, very difficult. But like Stacey says, it's a very quick um, fix a lot of the time for you to try. Like you mm -hmm. said, you know, well, we'll try it then. Because for so many dogs, I mean, most of the dogs that I've worked with, certainly the recent ones, when I've asked them if they've tried food or, you know, what they've tried previously, most of them have said that the dogs won't eat when they're not there anyway. Yeah. So that really just throws that one out yeah. before right they even start, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so quite what the other guys do when the dogs, their advice to give the dog a Kong doesn't work. I'm not really sure. What do they do? Who do you mean? I don't know. The yeah. trainers the, that the, say. Oh, trainers. The, yeah. 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 What's yeah. their next I, protocol? I'm not really that sure work. what they use. No. Um, uh, another thing, maybe an exception to the food thing, but it's not really an exception in training. It's just like, I have, um, a client right now, just one client of my clients whose dog will eat food, um, when she's gone and what we use it for, it takes her 40 minutes. We've tested it. Um, it takes her 40 minutes to finish a frozen Kong. So if, her mom needs to go get gas for the mower or run to the grocery store or whatever. We know we have 40 minutes plus 20 minutes, <laughs> plus 20 minutes after. Um, interestingly, without the Kong, she can do, she's on like an hour and 20 minutes now, but like 
oh, wow. with the Kong and then <laughs> her leaving because after like 20 minutes after the Kong, she wants to go out to go to the bathroom. Right. So the Kong is oh. not like saving anything, but it is something that um, it's kind of like a safety more net. Consistent. Yeah, it's a little mm. bit of a safety net. So I would say if you kind of have like an emergency leaving type of situation and your dog does eat while you're gone mm. and you can kind of cover that situation, like, you know, put out six Kongs, put out whatever <laughs> that's going to try to keep your dog as busy as possible. Um, mm. That can, can minimize the anxiety your dog feels like, obviously we would prefer that you find coverage and all that type of stuff so that your dog isn't left home longer than they can be comfortable. But sometimes there are emergencies in life. And if your mm -hmm. dog is one of those dogs that does eat, then having a Kong can help minimize the impact of that mm -hmm. home alone time if they're engaging with it for a majority of the time you're gone. I think one of the exceptions we might say is if the dog doesn't really have separation anxiety, if it, the behaviours it's doing look like separation anxiety, but mm -hmm. it could be frustration slash FOMO, yeah. and then, of course, mm -hmm. you add in your extra exercise and mental stimulation, which you should do anyway for separation anxiety dogs, but especially for FOMO frustrated dogs. Once you add that in, then, of course, and then you maybe give them a Kong. Maybe they're the exception um, because they're yeah. not. They're not. They're not scared. They're not anxious. They're just like, "Hey, come yeah. back! What are you? What are you doing? What are you doing?" Right. So that distraction might be beneficial in mm -hmm. those cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially yeah. for for bored dogs, dogs that are bored, that can give them something to occupy their time. So that's that's yeah. a really good point, Ness. If it's if it's not separation anxiety, but some of the behaviors look like that, then that can be yeah. a great. Um, and perhaps that's why so many vets. And that behaviorist suggests that as like kind of a first line is like, let's just see if this can be an easy fix. Um, mm. But mostly, I think by time people get to us, they've tried the easy fixes and yeah. it's not that, you know. Um, yeah. It's not that. I mean, that's that's like the the ones we've used where, where, with a crate where or where a dog's confined. And for some dogs, all you've got to do is unconfine them. And hey, presto magic change or the exactly. dog's not got separation anxiety and it's, it's the same thing I mean it's the same with all the things that we talk about there's never it's not a blanket approach to anything is it no. there are nuances no. and there are um reasons why you might do something slightly different so there are you know there are reasons why you might use food in particular circumstances and for particular dogs but it's definitely not a blanket approach and I think the thing that we want to get across to owners is Whichever way you go down this route, whichever way you want to treat your separation anxiety or the way that you want to get someone to help you, is in as much as you can get professional help. Try not to go to Dr. Google. As Ness mm -hmm. said, you know, basically a lot of the information from there is, you, you know, you would get better information from the back of your of your Kellogg's packet. Um, and you're going to get a lot of misinformation and you're going to go down a lot of dead end roads and get really yeah. frustrated and probably end up worse off than you started. So whichever way you go, make sure you seek a professional, whether that is a certified mm. separation anxiety specialist like us three or whether it's a vet behaviourist or your vet or, you know, the, um, a local, another local trainer that you've got. But as, as long as it's someone who at least has some good grounding in dog behavior or training start there because at least hopefully we like to think that at least you can you know you will get some good information rather than looking online first because online just oh some of the stuff that it comes out with is ridiculous but it's amazed as well because i mean i've had several clients say to me you know i started looking on google and then i'm like i just got so confused because this person was saying this, this person was saying this, this person was saying this. Um, and, yeah. yeah, they just they just don't know what's the correct advice. And, you know, just because somebody calls themselves an expert 
doesn't mean they are. <laughs> um, you know, so look for the certification like Ness, Stacey and uh, Sarah. Sarah's in the UK yeah. from Separation Anxiety Solutions. Stacey is from Focus Fun in the US. You can reach out to all of us on Separation Anxiety in Dogs Decoded in Australia, but you don't have to be in Australia New um, or the US or UK. You can be anywhere in the world because we work remotely with you. I was just thinking again along the lines of um, the distraction thing because one thing that Ness asked earlier was how, how do we teach dogs how to be alone what you know if we're not using food what do we do yeah. um, and you did mention uh, earlier with the fireworks that we use counter conditioning and desensitization and the difference mm -hmm. between using food and not using food is that not using food is pure desensitization without any frilly bits around it it's just basically starting starting the the thing the job the duration the whatever it is at a, a level that the dog can cope with without anything added to it mm -hmm. so that would be if you were to use uh, an analogy with a human being that would probably be the, the old spider or the the snake or the cockroach, it, Ness, cockroach. cockroach. yeah you know, we, we'd start with the cockroach two fields away for Ness. No, we, we wouldn't, wouldn't bring it into. Um, no, we wouldn't. We wouldn't do that at all. We no. would, no. <laughs> Not even that far. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you start with something. So we might show Ness maybe a picture of a cartoon cockroach uh, two fields away, yes. and hope that that wouldn't set her off. So mm -hmm. you start off with the intensity that your um, animal or your learner can cope with. Uh, and we very, very gradually increase that intensity, always staying under the level that your learner can cope with. Because if you push them over that threshold, then you're just going to end up right back at the beginning. Because this is a different process. We haven't got food to lean on here. We haven't got that extra frill or that extra thing to, to help us out here. All we've got is the desensitization. And then we also have to teach our owners how to cope with that as well, because they always want to go faster. They always want to do more. They want to, you know, can we add a bit of food in now? He's on his own for 10 minutes. Can we give him, a, you know, they always want to do that bit more. So then the other thing is about desensitization only works as long as you keep it at a level low enough for your learner. And that's the thing to rem remember, regardless of how long you're out the door for. So talking about food again, sorry, um, is... For example, if you showed me a cartoon photo of a cockroach and yeah. I was two fields away and then you also said, here's a tasty chocolate bar, I still wouldn't want the chocolate bar. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just be like, yeah, no. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, we, maybe if we showed you the cartoon cockroach three fields away uh, and then offer a match to what would you, um, do you like wine? Wine's not really good. No. Glass of wine. wine, yeah. Well, yeah, but I'd be like, um, because I'll need it because there's a scary cockroach over there. <laughs> you go, well, we could do that, and eventually, if you drank enough of the wine, it would work. <laughs> I'd be like, that's I the love you. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. You see, mm -hmm. conditioning works. <laughs> so what you're saying, Sarah, is we get our dogs drunk. Um, and then, <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> never, no, okay, never. I'm not, I'm not even going to say that in jest because there's bound no. to be somebody who'll come along and go, You said you should get your dog drunk. No, 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 no. <laughs> true, true, no, definitely not. I think I'm going pink here. Not that you, if you're listening, you can't see, but if you can see, so we've got a, a beautiful sunset oh. going on outside. Um, yeah, I can nice see you going pink, pink yeah. It's rosy pink blue. Very pretty. I mean, there are some dogs as well where once you get up to a certain level of duration that you can maybe leave things around for them to go and find on their own. You're not leaving it on purpose and going, here you are, have this, I'm going to leave you now. Uh, what you are right. doing is leaving some of the sort of longer lasting chews lurking around so that Mm. If they feel they want to go and choose something while you're not there, yeah. particularly the ones mm -hmm. that are doing better on durations and are, you know, and are getting getting the idea, like you said, you know, you don't want them getting bored when you're out. Particularly the young, some of the younger dogs. Um, right. But we also do need to be aware that there are a lot of chewy things and and toys and stuff that ideally should not be left with a dog unsupervised. So do remember that, particularly with the youngsters. So we're yeah, not advocating right. that you. 
No, I think for training purposes, that might not be an issue because you'll have a camera on watching. It's if you've actually built up that duration and you've said, oh, I probably don't need this camera so much anymore. Um, but I have had clients where I'll, you know, I don't mind if they've got some chew that there's already lying around and it's just lying around all right. day, 24 hours a day. And whenever the dog wants to have a, a yeah. nibble at camp, yeah. I don't really say, no, nah, get that out yeah. of the picture. I'll just let it stay there. And sometimes the dog will, you know, if they're relaxed enough, they will go and have a nibble. So, which is good. Is it, yeah. I think that for me is a good signal or a sign that the dog is pretty comfortable and they're not struggling. So, um, but yeah, yeah. I never, certainly never say get the food out before you walk out the door. Yeah. Right. Right. But okay. anybody struggling with um, other doggy issues? So we talked about reactivity on the lead before. I um, hope you girls don't yeah. mind that I mention this, but um, I have a summit. Go for it. <laughs> I have a summit coming up. Um, if, if you're watching this um, uh, before July the 11th um, or listening to it, July the 11th, 2022. <laughs> it is 2022, isn't it? Yeah. Decoding Your Canine Summit. It's www.decodingyourcanine.com. And there are 28 plus speakers and they're talking about all different things, including nutrition, fitness, photography. Um, reactivity is a big one. There's a few talking about that. Um, there's uh, aggression. Um, I'll be talking about separation anxiety um and yeah so just training in general keeping your dog calm it's really interesting speakers uh some real world-renowned ones that was so, awesome yeah so get into that it's um free and there's also you can purchase an all access pass which gives you lifetime access and all the speakers are offering free gifts Woo! Mm, very nice. exciting Thank yeah you. that is exciting yeah so um, even if you're listening or watching this afterwards, if you want to get the all um, access pass, it'll be available um, on my website at some point. Yeah. Yay. Or email me nice. at nestjones.com um, on my website and say, hey, how do I get hold of this? Hey. <laughs> hey. Let me in, hey. let me in. Cool. Very cool. Um, Sarah, what's the update on um, Boat Life? Yes, that's the exciting stuff. I was just telling Ness before um, we came on air that this morning the downside of boat life was apparent when um, Ernie threw up on the bed. Mm. <laughs> so we were rudely that's awakened okay. by that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but actually, we, we, we're doing was okay. He we get... was, was he seasick? No. <laughs> <laughs> We, I mean, what's the difference between him throwing up on the bed on the boat or at your previous home? Well, the trouble with on, on the boat, the bed is higher so that we can use underneath the bed for storage because obviously storage is a premium on something that's like six foot, six foot wide. Mm. Um, so he can't get off the bed. So he's uh, that. That was the thing was that he was throwing up at half past six, and I was flailing around because I'm I'm stuck against the wall, and I was trying to get my husband out of the bed and going, "Whoop, he's sick, he's sick," uh, you know. I'm basically in lots of noise. Uh, so yeah, so he couldn't get off. Normally at home, he would have at home. Where in on in bricks and mortar, he would have got off the bed and gone outside into the hallway, and we'd have managed to get him outside and so on and so forth. But on a boat, it was slightly different. Mm. But he is. Um, He's getting used to boat life. The both are now. They're um they're settling down quite well. So training will be starting soon for young Ernie. Ha 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 ha. Mm. In young Ernie will be training in earnest. <laughs> nice. Whereas now he's still and you won't be he's using your little jar of now. food to do the training. No, I won't. My jar of food will remain exactly where it is upon the side. Is Ernie on, on medication? Board? No. No, no, he isn't. Uh, we did try some in the past, but uh, he's one of these little puppies where actually most of the medications just seem to make him worse. Mm -hmm. So oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's yeah. slow and steady wins the race with young Ernie. Yeah. I'm afraid. I Woo believe in you. <laughs> so we are going to have to also do some um, map training with him because one of the things that he's learned on the boat is that if the front door's open, and that he can dash out and leap out onto the side and run off. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. gosh. <laughs> yeah. So we uh, need to stop that. 
Get out of a door, Dasha. No. 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 Not good. No. Well, so, very good. Thanks for the update. You're welcome. <laughs> I can't wait to um, see your weekly diet. What are you calling it? The diary? Leaving early? Oh, the vlog. It'll be a vlog. A vlog. A video. Yes, a vlog. video of the vlog. Yes, a vlog, as they call mm. it. And yeah. how was July the 4th for you, um, Stacey? Any oh, fire? Rowan, that is one of the few things that Rowan is not bothered by. Fireworks, yeah. So, fireworks, thunderstorms, he's fine with. Um, That's fabulous. Somebody trying to deliver a package, not so much. But, you know, <laughs> we all have our crosses to bear. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yep. So, um, anyways, yeah, it was fine for me. He's he's fine. Cool. So, I mean, Yay. I wouldn't take him to a park where they were letting off fireworks, no. but he's fine with just like hearing them around here. So, right. Very good. Well, we will see you guys in two weeks with another misconception. No. Thanks for doing no, 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 not no, 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 no. The other one's going to happen. A special guest, right? Two special guests. Oh, I am so excited for two. that. Two, not one, but two. <laughs> yes. Two. Yes, I had forgotten that. So we'll skip our myth conception for ne next time and do our super special um, guests. And then after that, we'll pick it back up. Oh, I forgot you'll about have, that. I'm so excited. You'll have to wait to hear who it is. Woo. Yes, you will. It's a surprise. <laughs> it'll be it'll be a sea of faces on YouTube. There'll be just a sea of faces. You yes. don't know which one to look at. There will be. See, say she she can't help herself, can you? Did you hear what she did there? A sea of faces. <laughs> she is she's very punny lately she's getting very nautical in her her puns yeah terminology yes she is yes she is all right well thank you guys for joining us today you can as you probably know if you're listening find us in all of the usual listening platforms and on youtube um if you haven't liked or subscribed to us where you are or left a review please do that it helps other people find us and it's also really reinforcing for us um i am stacy bell with focused fun in the u.s and and sarah's frozen <laughs> so sarah's frozen uh, so, can you speak oh. sarah do you want to build a snowman <laughs> oh yeah she's singing now oh. I'm singing now. Yeah, I better say bye quick, aren't I? Yes, yeah, so I think the guy said uh, on YouTube, subscribe and hit the little bell icon so that you get a notification when we've got a new video out. That's uh, <laughs> but hopefully this will come back on at some point. Yeah. Bye. So Sarah is really frozen then. If you missed that, make sure you hit the subscribe button and. Um, yeah, yeah, so you get notifications for when the next episode is out. Um, I yep. Sarah is Sarah McLaren from the UK from Separation Anxiety Solutions. <laughs> I'm just gonna make sure you, um, you reach out to her if you're in her area and you need some help. Um, I'm Ness Jones. I'm from Separation Anxiety in Dogs Decoded. Reach out to any of us if you need some specialist certified help with your doggy. Otherwise, Fabulous. see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, a couple of people. Bye. See ya. Yeah. Bye. Oh.